Shemach Israel, hear, O Israel. The adult Jew to this day has the obligation of repeating this ancient cry. And it is actually something that we can take on board, as we have in the Divine Office on a Saturday night, the beginning of our Sunday. We have it there at Compline, and we are reminded of the essence of it all. A good way to begin our Sabbath rest, placing God in the midst, enthroning him in time. These pauses are important. The itch by those who, unawares, in Ireland, have to take away the slops of peace, the little moments of nothingness but verticality, are emblematic. They are a symptom of our times. We can't bear one minute silence. The pain of a pause of one long minute at six o'clock in the evening or twelve midday is just too much for a hurried man. We must be always listening to talking to people, spouting all kinds of noises, often against God, all the time, all the time, all the time. These calls remind us of who reigns and whose time is. We have it in our hands on loan as the 118th Psalm has it in Manibus Tuis Tempora Mea, or rather that's another psalm, in your hands are my times. But in the 118th Psalm we have this word, Anima Mea, in Manibus Meis, Manibus Meis, Anima Mea, my soul is in my hands. By that choosing of moments empty of hurry, empty of haste, we in some way also have mercy on our soul. Parce anime tue, have mercy on your soul. We give the soul a chance to breathe. We give the soul the chance not to be contaminated all the time by solicitations outside itself. Words, words, words. We cannot bear one pause. And even our Sabbath pause, far from the rest what the word Sabbath means, Sabbat, Shabbat means precisely that we have that moment of vacation being empty, vacari, for ourselves and for God. The fact that we cannot have it even in our liturgical assemblies the which also are contaminated by hurry and haste and many, many words, is an indication of the extent to which we too do not ca take care of our soul. And so we rush from beginning to end of our brief, brief life, having but not done nothing but try to beat the clock, get to places by deadlines, always rushing, never relaxing as we walk, unable to enjoy the joy of simple things, for our mind was overcluttered by the next. <clears throat> John Lennon was once heard to say that life is what happens when one is planning what to do. So, here we are, listening to the voice of the Lord coming through as he takes up this word from Deuteronomy and gives it as the essence of it all, giving God his place, offering him the throne of the heart. We have not only the throne here of the heart, the affective bonding, but also the soul the mind and the strength, that is, execution of his divine will. It's one whole. 
it's interesting that here we have the word mind translated as understanding here coming in, which is actually not in the original text in Deuteronomy. With all your heart, with all your understanding. And we have also the inseparable bonding with our neighbour. Now, this word neighbour can be seen in the German language for what it is, Nachbar, it's the one next to us, which is what precisely we have in the original languages. We have it coming through into Latin as proximus, the one right next to us, the most close to us. It's also there in the Greek, plesion, it's the most adjacent, it's the one right there next to us. So if we ask, how do we do it? Well, the answer is not complicated. We make it complicated. We don't try to express charity to people on the other side of the world, and then permit ourselves unpleasant words to the person right next to us, as though there were a higher sanctity in giving, for instance, a lot of money to somebody that we cannot see, whereas we do not care how we handle the one that we can. Indeed, St. John does remind us that we cannot love God whom we cannot see if we do not love our neighbour whom we can. The advantage of putting these completely in juxtaposition to each other is that it avoids illusion. The Lord does say it is similar. And so it is that we find at the end of the Gospel, in the last will and testimony of the Lord, this new commandment, not a very long set of rubrics, not even a code, no, an extension of the Incarnation, as I have loved you, so that Christians should be emanators of peace and warmth and therefore healing. There's an old saying in French, un, un saint triste est un triste saint. A sad saint is a sorry saint. And therefore, not a noisy effervescence of external joy, but a desire to give healing to every neighbour, to every next one, is the bottom line. Am I actually giving peace or am I hurting those in my immediate vicinity? There is the concrete test. And we can elude ourselves if we think we are enjoying the presence of God, in adoration, and then shortly afterwards not adoring him in the mystery of the soul inhabited by him. It is one worship in a different mode. We honour Christ present in the mystery of that soul where he has promised to dwell if that soul is in a state of grace. He hears our words just as he hears our prayers. But he hears our prayers with more delight if our heart is engaged. Hence, this reference to the heart is important. With all your heart. No one else, not even the most intimate friend, has the right to the throne of God in the heart. We love others in him. They are his gift to us as means to love him. And we must not either be an idol to someone else to the extent that we reign over their heart exclusively and intrusively. We let them love Jesus in us. We are to be icons, living icons. And that should naturally draw, without in any way deflecting from God, but convecting his heat, inviting others to experience warmth and love. <clears throat> in the Acts of the Apostles, we have that reference to the fact that it was noted by those who saw the apostles, that they had been with Jesus. It should be the same with us. When we come from his presence, we should, like Moses, be radiant. We have been touching joy, for bliss is joy. Let us then ask this grace not to clutter our minds with things that enable us to love only the things of the mind without loving those of the heart. That is, the mind full of 
all kinds of problems to be solved, even for God, things which have to work. Our minds are so full that God has little space. Our thoughts are cluttered by things that we do for God, technical things, things that have to work, or God will not be honoured. Well, he's not being honoured when our mind is not available unto him to that extent. And so, with all our strength, we love God. We actually command, through the faculty of the will, the limbs to operate in a certain coherent way so that God reigns over our actions and we give him our strength. This emphasis on the body out of proportion is something sometimes questionable. So much sport on the day where God should reign can be over the top. Somebody once said in a sermon in Ireland, it was a good priest, how is God spent in Ireland? I better not repeat the way he spelt it, but I think we know what we mean. He juggled with the three letters. Yes, if we're not careful, sport can take the place of the main event of the week, where God is God in time, and where he has the maximum of our attention, not God shunted to the touchline for a ball matters more than the sacred host. No, God deserves the best, prime time, not just the margin of our life. We need to have rest to listen well to the word of God. We need to open that word. We need to taste the joy of hearing the word of the Lord echo in our heart. We're too hurried to get out of church and to do what really matters. There is time for what matters. And if we don't make that time, and I mean make that time, we too are out of control. We have become what an abbot once said was the danger for even a contemplative monastery. One great machine eating itself up.